Slam the red for no loss. There's only one opposition today, so uh, valid time out kill, but we will have a wild card in there just to keep us amused. Training. We're going to have to make sure we target and sort if it's uh, okay. On today's Top Gear, we'll be looking at the new 5 Series BMW, the epic Ford GT, and Porsche's fearsome GT3. Hello. Now, when we were putting this new type of Top Gear together, we made a decision. We would not squander the license fee payers' money on airfares jetting off to the other side of the world to drive cars. We would wait for them to come to us. This was a hard and fast rule, and it would never be broken. Come to Detroit, which in my defense is not exactly Saint-Tropez. God may have created the world in six days, but while he was resting on the seventh, Beelzebub popped up and did this place. Back in the 60s, Detroit was the home of Motown and Motor City. But the riots of 67 left it a deserted and shattered shell. So, I haven't come here for a holiday. I've come here for something even better. This is the new Ford GT. It's the first proper supercar ever made in America. It was built to celebrate Ford's 100th birthday. But there's a lot more to it than that. Over the years, there have been a couple of attempts to try and rekindle the GT40 magic. There was the GT70, which I bought. Here it is, look. Doors open and everything. Fantastic. And then in 1995, there was the GT90. I actually drove this and it was horrid. Had a top speed of 40 and it handled like it was in a cartoon. Ford realized that the only way forwards was to go backwards. This is the result. It looks almost identical to the old GT40, although because this one was built in America, it is bigger than the one built in Britain. Longer, wider and taller, but still just as good looking. This car shows that the desolate and smashed city of Detroit, one of the most dangerous places on earth, is not quite dead. It's still coughing up blood and guts. Don't think, however, that this is just some evolutionary throwback. Ford wanted it to be much more than a pretty face. They wanted it to handle like a Lotus Elise, sound like a Honda NSX, shock like a Lamborghini Diablo, and go like a Ferrari 360. Now on that last front, the speed thing, I think they may have overdone it. You see, it offers up 500 brake horsepower and that's 100 more than you get from a 360. And you get twice the torque, over twice the rev range. So with its top speed of 200 miles an hour, this thing once again will blow Ferrari into the middle of next week. Obvious 
obviously, you don't get the sense that the engine was made by craftsmen using techniques passed from father to son over the generations, because, of course, it wasn't. Actually, the 5.4-litre supercharged V8 is lifted out of one of Ford's pickup trucks. <laughs> this, then, is a blue-collar car with a blue-collar punch. It's a working-class hero. Let's go hunting for aristocrats. Shout them to death. <laughs> Of course, Americans have never had a problem making stuff go fast in a straight line. The Space Shuttle, the Corvette, the Boeing 747, and so on. But they have never, and I've checked this out with all the experts, they've never made a car that can go around corners properly. Until now. Comfort's a bit shabby, but as far as handling and grip are concerned, it is epic. So it goes fast, handles well, looks astonishing, and we haven't even got to the second best thing about it yet. The clutch is so light, even someone from a Lowry painting could press it. The steering's light, the gearbox is light, I've got air conditioning, I've got a stereo, I've got electric windows, I've got central locking, and yet, none of the essence of the GT40 has been lost. Look at these doors, for instance. They still cut into the roof. And just like on the old car, you can see the engine through the back window. Mind you, not as well as if you open up the clamshell. Oh, look at that. Look at it. Makes me feel six years old all over again. In fact, I think I've just wet myself. Amazingly then, Ford seems to have done it. The GT does handle like a Lotus, it does shock like a Lambo, and it goes harder and faster than a Ferrari. best thing about it, it's priced like a Ford. Even though it'll only be built in tiny numbers, it's going to be less than £100,000. That's 8000 less than the Ferrari and 17000 less than the Lamborghini Gallardo. I love this thing. I love it even more than I thought I was going to. Feel that power. I love it mostly, though, because it takes you back to a time when Detroit was humming to the petrolhead rhythm of the Motown sound. A time when the Temptations provided the desk ant and the factories were on base. A time when the street echoed to the sound of dancing and the roar of last chance heroes in their V8 muscle cars racing between the lights. I have always wanted to do this. Was that legal, sir? Uh, well, I don't know. The thing was, is when we said we were going to film in the middle of Detroit, which is kind of even more dangerous than Birmingham, we got four police patrol cars to follow us everywhere, and I did that charging off 120 miles an hour right through the city centre, got back expecting them to say, have you been smoking? And they were just sitting <laughs> in their patrol cars eating donuts. Couldn't give a damn. Now, this is an original, which is really a British car. Yeah. That is an all-American supercar. No. That's not an all-American supercar. No. You're absolutely right. I said, they say this is an all-American car. It isn't. In fact, the steering comes from an Aston Martin Vanquish. The it brakes are Italian. A couple of guys from Lotus did the suspension. The body's British. It's not American Yeah, but these are all. technicalities. We're talking about the nation that won the Battle of Britain. Absolutely. Ben Affleck did that on his own. <laughs> And they rescued Europe from Sir Winston Hitler. They did. And <laughs> what made it particularly good was when I was driving around Detroit in that thing, everyone you see, all four of them, they're, hey, nice Ferrari! <laughs> <laughs> all of them. 
Now, just tell me, can I go and buy this from a Ford dealer in Britain? Not this. This is Not an old this, one. This, this is about £350,000. But you can walk into a dealer in Barnsley tomorrow, slap down your £90,000, £100,000, whatever it's going to cost, and you can buy one of those things. Would you? Yeah. In Barnsley? No, I'd be even more fun. <laughs> Actually, I, if I do decide to get one, and I'm sort of... The whole thing, I will buy it from Barnsley. Whoever the dealer is in Barnsley, I'm on my way, probably. <laughs> Here's another new Ford. It's called the Vsauce. And look at this shape. Very cutting edge. And then the interior. Wow. And those dials, they're all spangly, clever, up to the minute computer stuff. And there's no mirrors. Look, cameras instead. Are oh, you? Yeah. It's a very modern car, no doubt. But look a bit more closely. And look, there's these grills on the flank. And then the shape of this window. Now, you can't fool me. If Ford ever actually make this car for real, this is the new Capri. No doubt about it. Tell you what, though, you know in the olden days when people actually had Capris? They always had the bonnet up on a Saturday tinkering around with the engine. Fettling. Exactly. Well, nowadays, people always fiddle around with computers. Yeah. So what this has got, which is amazing, well, if they ever get around to putting a bonnet in it, which they haven't at the moment, it'll have a... Plug. It's plug, port, port thing, you put your laptop in it and you'll be able to adjust like the rev limiter and the suspension settings and everything. But it goes further than that, it's very clever because once you've got your laptop plugged in, you can then uh, log onto the internet and you can actually download specifications and settings direct from Ford and better than that even, you can then exchange data with your mates and their Vsauce. So if you got one, I could set the rev limit at like 1500 RPM. Have the headlamps flash every time we went above 10. <laughs> Not quite what they meant there really. Or Jerry. even better, if you get stuck behind one on the road, what you could do is dial up its computer from your laptop, Bluetooth, mobile phone, speed him up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> 50, and that's... then just apply one of the rear brakes. Yeah, that's just stupid. <laughs> it's stupid. Let's do the news. Now, as this is the only programme on television that doesn't feature Jonathan Ross, we thought we'd try and work him in by apologising to him. In the last series, we said that Mr Ross had spent millions of pounds on a number plate that spelt Ross. However, our source for this story was the Sunday Express, and it's not true. So, Jonathan, we're sorry. We would like to formally retract any suggestion that you are a big dandy with more money than taste. Good, well done. That's got out of the way now. News. Um, there's a new golf that happened while we were away having our summer holidays. There it is. Uh, we'd love to tell you what it's like, but we can't because we went one mile down the road in it and the clutch went. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one I'd like to get over with very quickly, all right? We've charted the gradual sliding downhill of Jaguar. Last series we spoke about the diesel. Now it's got an awful lot worse. The new X-Type Estate. This is an Estate Jaguar front-wheel drive. What's with that? That's Look, dreadful. Well, it's an awful idea, Jeremy. Well, Look at that. Well, you got a dog, now you can have a dog in a cat. Oh! <laughs> no, I just don't see what's it wrong with like it. It looks like a Mondeo. It's terribly it is depressing. It's a Mondeo. It's very what have you got? Stagecoach. These are the bus operator people. They've come up with something remarkable. It's a 94-seater, double-decker coach which will take you between Oxford and London or Glasgow and Edinburgh for a pound. And they've said, we're going to take the frills out of bus travel. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> but, but believe it or not, OK, I was... I said, well, what are... They? But there were some. They've taken out the telly, the woman at the front with the microphone who points out the Tower of London, and the lavatory. What? There's no lavatory on the bus. Didn't there? Do you have, do you have lavatories on buses? Don't worry about it, Jeremy. Does anybody you never here have, know? Never do they have a lavatory? Of course you have lavatories on buses. Of course they do. Buses. Have you not used one? You've got a Lotus exit. Honestly, that's why you'd go on the bus, obviously. <laughs> have you never um, tried the lavatory? You have, you've never been on a bus. I've never been on a bus. bus. Well, I can there. show you how they work. Look, here's... It's, you sit next to somebody like that, but there's a little wall about that thick. He's parking his breakfast. Trousers round ankles. I'm reading Woman's Own because I'm, a, you know, 85-year-old And he's just driving along the M40 like that. And you're having a number two. Yes. Is He's reading the like on the bus yes. and now they've taken the lavatory out? Yes. Yeah. But what really amazes me is this, OK? It's got 94 seats, they say we can sell the seats for a pound. To maximise profits, they've taken out the lavatory, which is obviously the size of one seat. So they've made an extra quid. <laughs> by delivering a load of constipated is, people to Oxford. The next thing that's going to happen is people will be with primus stoves cooking their lunch on the floor and live chickens, and people arriving on the underside of Eurostar from Azerbaijan will see one of those things go by and think, <laughs> we haven't, we've gone around a big circle, I'm back in Azerbaijan again. <laughs> Got this is the one. third world, for God's sake. Actually, if there's I no know... tap lavatory, they should just get rid of the back window and have a plank with holes in it. In fact, that's just like following a, a rugby tour, because they've yes. always got their back. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I never got to no, but no different. Seriously, though, Stagecoach, I've worked this out. If you want this business venture to be a success, seats for a pound, 94-seater coach, don't take the lavatory out of the bus, make every seat a bog. <laughs> right, brilliant. Perfection. You could all read the paper. It's rubbish, isn't it, that? Mm. Yeah. I'm going to talk about the new Ferrari. <clears throat> It's called the Scalietti, and it replaces yeah, yeah. the 456, so it's the new four-seater, and it's gorgeous, and Jeremy's How much is wrong. it? It's about 150, just under 150,000 pounds. How big is the engine? Uh, it's four point something litres, 4.6. It's 540 brake horsepower, 0 to 60 in about four and a bit seconds. I don't like it. You're so wrong. It's very good-looking car. Can we just it's stop beautiful. spinning the tape? Hold the tape there. That does not look like a Ferrari. Not your schoolboy idea of a wedge Ferrari. It's the a problem is, it's designed, it's designed by Pininfarina, OK? Now, Pininfarina's top designer at the moment is a man called Ken. Yes. Now, people called Ken are people you borrow lawnmowers from. <laughs> no yeah. great person in history. It was not Ken Rembrandt. It no. was not Ken Chopin. There's never been a Pope Ken, has No, there, there has it? been a King Kenneth in England. But that was a Kenneth, like Kenneth Kendall. That's allowed. But not Ken. You can't have a Ferrari Ken. <laughs> That's, it's an interesting case in point. When was the last, and you were invited to join in here, when was the last really good-looking Ferrari? 456. 456 four, five, now looks yeah. great. 575 is a fabulous-looking 355 five, five looked good when it came out, but dated, and actually now looks Football quite... Football Ferrari, old. and he had one. I always thought the... It's the oh, ball! No, 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 no. <laughs> What do you think? <laughs> The 412 series. No. The 412? Oh dear. You've got a beard. <laughs> Be in the night. Your opinion. It's all slipped down here. <laughs> what don't you like about that? I don't actually like it very much. I'm just interested to know what you don't like about it. I'm not. It's got no arse. Neither have you anymore. You've lost quite a bit of weight, haven't you, oh. since the last series? <laughs> I was hoping you'd notice, actually. Look at that. No, that's not your ass, so that's much your we could have made another him out of what yeah. I've lost. <laughs> True. It's, no, there must have been a good-looking Ferrari. Ignore Beardy. There yeah. must have been a good-looking <laughs> Ferrari <laughs> between the Daytona and now. What? Cheap, what, the 288? The vampire, I reckon, has got it. The 288 <laughs> GTO <laughs> in blood red. Sat up from his coffin. Steve Strange <laughs> over there. Yeah. He's worked it out. <laughs> anyway, this is the BMW 5 Series. Now, this car came out about seven years ago. When it did, it was generally regarded as the finest car of its type. It's just gone out of production, which is odd, really, because it's still generally regarded as the finest car of its type. The new one, then, has got quite a lot to live up to. So it seems odd, then, that BMW should take such a gamble. Have a look at this. You see, on paper, the new 5 Series is even better than the old one. It's lighter, faster, roomier, and it has more gadgets. But none of that matters for the moment. The important question is this. Is it ugly? The BMW 5 Series was always a very conservative car. But that also meant that it was discreet and inoffensive, and very business-like, a bit like a good receptionist. And like a good receptionist, everybody wanted one. Not anymore. This new look is controversial. It's all odd angles and edges. And if you don't like the outside, the bad news is they've done it in here as well. I know some of the 5 Series faithful, and I also know that, without question, they're going to be put off by this new one. However, I like it. I think it's modern and groovy. It'll take a bit of getting used to, I know, but, you know, the good stuff always does. Anyway, there's a lot more to life than just good looks. I'm just as interested in personality. Given the way BMW's always boasting about ultimate driving machines and what have you, you'd expect that this 5 Series would be very, very good to drive, and it is. It's front-engined and rear-wheel drive, but more importantly than that, they've used a lot of aluminium in the bodywork to keep the weight distribution absolutely spot on, and this is very good for feel. And then we come to the engines. This is a 530i. 
It's powered by a three litre straight six petrol engine and it's lovely. For exactly the same money, which is a fibre under £31,000, you can also have a three litre diesel. I've tried that as well and it is, frankly, astonishingly good. So, as management types would say, that's all the basic boxes ticked. But there's more. This car is dripping with what those same people would call intelligent solutions. There's a system called Dynamic Drive, which gives you a nice, comfy ride under normal conditions, but then firms up the suspension under hard cornering. So it's soft when you're just cruising along, but it becomes all taut when you're giving it the berries. It may cost an extra 1,500 quid, but the thing is, it works, so I'll have it. And I wish I could say that about another new gizmo called Active Steering. It's supposed to make the steering more direct at low speeds to make it easier to turn corners, but less direct at high speeds so the car doesn't become twitchy on the motorway. Or at least, that's what it said in the brochure. But to be honest, I just can't really tell the difference. So, I'm saving my 830 quid, spending it on American hard guns. And I haven't finished yet. Now, the old 5 Series famously had more computing power than the Apollo spacecraft that went to the moon. But this one seems to be boldly going where no executive car has gone before. Most of the dashboard buttons have been replaced by a TV screen and this sort of upturned pie dish down here. It controls everything. The air conditioning, the stereo, the sat-nav, even how long the lights stay on after you've parked up at night. This is my favourite though. It's a sort of radar parking device. Normally I look for really easy parking spaces, but in the BMW I look for the tricky ones, just for the fun of it. So there we go. It's great to drive and it comes with its own amusement arcade. The 5 Series is still a very good car, still a great piece of German engineering. It's just that it's exchanged the easily digestible looks of Tom Cruise for the more challenging physiognomy of that Gerard Dupidou bloke. So, what about the rivals? There's the Jaguar S-Type, a great drive, but look at its face. And there's the Mercedes E-Class, a fabulous car for your retirement. Choosing a 5 Series used to be considered a bit of a no-brainer. It still is. Were you in any way unwell when you recorded that? Well, actually, I did have a really bad dose of the pox. That explains it. <laughs> Because anybody whose eyes were working properly would recognise that this is the ugliest oh. thing. It is! It is a it's superb the first looking car, ever car where children will be sick before they get in the back. Rubbish. <laughs> we'll have a vote. Right. Hands up, everyone who thinks it's ugly. I didn't prompt them or anything. <laughs> now, hands up those who think it's not ugly. You see, all the ones who've right. their glasses at home. All right, all right. <laughs> You are an executive. This is going to take a bit of imagination. You're an executive, OK, and you're going to buy a new car. You're not going to buy that S-Type Jag, are you? It's no. a great drive, but you wouldn't let your kids sit around with their mouths open like that. No. E-Class Mercedes. Now, you've got a Mercedes. How much have you enjoyed it over the summer? No, I haven't. It's been in the shop the entire time. It goes in, it's broken, it comes back more broken and goes in again. That's right. pretty much Mercedes ownership. These so you're days. not having one of those? No. You're not having an Audi A6 because it's too old? Uh, no. You're not having a Kia Magentis because it's I stupid? Might. No, you wouldn't. No, you're right, I wouldn't. And you're not going to have an Alpha 166 because nobody would buy a new one? Yeah. You, Jeremy Clarkson, you are the European Director of Photocopying, brackets, toner distribution, you will buy one of these. Now, as I'm sure you know, we're not fans of diesel on this programme. We think it is the fuel of Satan. But in the summer, I drove one of these. It's the E-Class Mercedes Diesel Saloon. And then I noticed something strange. These are the figures, OK? This is the petrol one, this is the diesel. The diesel is more powerful, same 0 to 60, faster, much more economical, cheaper, and, as far as I could tell, no noisier. And that got me thinking. Maybe, while I've been wearing my blinkers, something strange has happened. 
Maybe all diesel cars are now OK. <laughs> This is a diesel-powered Volkswagen Lupo, so we all know what to expect. It'll make the sound of the farmyard and accelerate like a dog on a rug. Or is that wrong? Well, let's find out. I'm going to do one lap of the M25 in this thing to see if it's bearable. And to make it more interesting, I shall be going in convoy with a petrol-powered Lupo. And the producer has said, however much money I save in fuel by driving this, I can spend in the shop. Like all motorway service stations, there's much to choose from. 4 99 for a Cliff Richard calendar. Tempting. Look at this gold-plated crystal telephone. I mean, who's going around the M25 and thinks, I've suddenly decided I need a pair of trousers? Oh, for God's sake. My video's in the discount bin. $3.99. With both cars full to the brim of fuel, it was time to set off. Rough with the smooth on Top Gear this week, then. A little while ago, I was doing burnouts in a burnt-out city in a Ford GT with 500 million brake horsepower. And now I'm going round the most boring road in the world in a diesel Lupo. Actually, I like the Lupo. I like its mad face and its tininess. Best of all, though, it doesn't feel like a small car. I know it's more expensive than all its rivals and the boot is pathetic, but there's an enormous amount of space up here and a sense of what the Germans call cavality. But now for the nitty-gritty. This 1.4-litre diesel version cost £10,200, exactly the same as the 1.4-litre petrol version. They both have power steering, both have stereos, both have alloy wheels. Obviously, the petrol version's faster. It'll do 120. Whereas the diesel car won't. They've helped it along with a turbo, but it'll barely do 105, and 0 to 60 takes 12 seconds. 0 to 60 in double figures. Well, I didn't know that was still possible. The thing is, though, that in the real world, you never go from 0 to 60, and you never go flat out. What you do is go from 50 to 70 a lot, in fifth. And that's where the diesel engine comes in. No one knows what torque is, but this has 144 of them. 144 torques live under its bonnet. Obviously, you shouldn't listen to those people who say, oh, we can't tell it's a diesel under the bonnet. Sounds just like a petrol, because it doesn't. It sounds like it's been fueled with sandpaper. But, crucially, it's not so noisy that I can't hear Ken Bruce's Potmaster. Give me the titles of three UK single chart hits for Squeeze. Three. Call for cats, labelled with love, at the yep. junction. Come on, useless man. Easy. Throw that potmaster over for another day and now I'm bored. People are always being rude about the M25. Oh, it's got 73 miles of jams on any given Monday. But think about it. I know it should be wider. I know there should be 68 lanes in either direction. But 200,000 cars a day use this thing. 200,000, and imagine where they'd all go if it weren't here. To go to Carsholton and Watford. Do you want to go to Watford? Hmm? Oh, no. There I was defending the M25, and now... Oh. I love people's faces in traffic jams. Oh, is it so miserable? Could be worse. You could be shot in the back of the head by a marksman. 
But even though the motorway let us down, I have to say the diesel was good to us. Not just bearable, but faster where it matters than the petrol. And because of all those torques, you have to change gear less often, and that makes it more relaxing to drive. I'm in the outside lane of a British motorway doing outside lane of British motorway speeds in my 1.4 diesel city car, and it's fine. I have to say I am impressed. Painfully, painfully impressed. And we haven't even got to the business of fuel economy yet. Right, that is now brimmed. And the news is, frankly, astonishing because this little diesel here has done 75 miles to the gallon and the petrol only managed 42 miles to the gallon. And that's a huge gulf. So are the savings. On just one lap of the M25, 119 miles, I've saved £4.29p, which I'm now going to go and spend in the shop. So what do you spend your £4.29 on then? Oh, I spent it on a cock. Let's have a look. <laughs> look at that. Oh, look. Gold just, with real crystals. I'll just share that with the nation. Do you know what? That is so awful that if that had been me, I think I'd have had your video and kept the change. <laughs> <laughs> no, the thing that occurred to me is if you went round to the M25, I don't know, there were probably 20 of those different statuette things, you could get the lot. The producer says, if I go round again, I can have a beaver. A golden beaver. A golden beaver. <laughs> Do you honestly think I am going to put up with a small diesel hatchback just so that I can have a golden cock? <laughs> yes, almost certainly. Listen, the thing is, it is faster. I promise you, James, I... Pr I, I promise you it isn't. Well, it... I, I organised a race this morning around the track. In the wet, the petrol lupo was six seconds quicker. That is eternity. On, on the motorway, track. 50 to 70, you put your foot down in the diesel and the bloke and the petrol one's fishing around. And also, if I can just think back to when you were driving that 5 Series, you said you were driving the 3 litre petrol, you've driven the 3 litre diesel, and I'm quoting, and it was astonishing. Yeah, the, the big 3 litre BMW engine is astonishing, as that Mercedes one is that you drove, but on a small hatchback, OK? When you drive one of those and it's a diesel, it says three things about you. One is, you're tighter than two coats of paint. The second one is that you care so much about the environment that you want to leave a little protective sooty film over it. And the third one is, you're probably French. I've suddenly remembered why I don't like talking to you. So I'm going to go and talk to my best friend, the little one. Now, we get thousands of letters every week sent here to our Top Gear office. And to be honest, most of them we ignore. Until recently, we suddenly decided, well, this is an untapped resource. And we've spotted a bit of a theme developing. Absolutely. We get a hundred million letters every week from women complaining about their men's love of cars. This is true. We do. We don't write to Trini and Susanna on what not to wear and complain about women coming out of changing rooms going, this dress is perfect and I love the colour, I'll try something else on. No, we don't. And yet, let me just share this one. This is from Corinna Behrman of uh, Swindon, and she says, in December last year, I was expecting our baby. I went into labour, we went to hospital, my labour turned out to be slow, and we sat watching television in the communal lounge area. Top Gear came on as I started to get painful contractions. My fiancé, Darren, as always, was glued to your programme, was oblivious to the pain I was in. Occasionally, he turned to me and asked, all right? <laughs> and then turned back to your programme before I'd even responded. Only after Top Gear had finished did he pay any attention we were able to go back to my hospital room. Yes, if you're going to write a letter in, try and have a point or maybe something contentious in there. I don't know, what's that about? I have um, no idea. This theme continues. I've got one here. Now, along the same sort of line. Hi, Jeremy! With an exclamation mark. It's very irritating. Um, my book, this is from Claire, and she signed it with a little X, which is like a little kiss. <laughs> my boyfriend has just bought a new Audi A3. Fair enough. Now he's driving me mad with this new game he has where he tries to plip the remote locking from as far away as possible. Is he normal? Yes, clearly. In fact, I'd say, if anything, he sounds like a bit of an amateur. Yeah, because it's how you do the plip In that fact, matters. Claire, I'm, go Claire, I'm going to... This is for your fella. I'm going to show some moves here. Yeah. I've, got, I've got some special yeah. ones. This, um, this first one is called the Bond, and it's perhaps more of a closing manoeuvre. So the car's there, and you, you walk away from your car thus, and then at the last minute, you turn and fire. <laughs> That's the, it's a simple, good one to start with, I reckon. Keeping the range good. Yep. I quite like the high shot. 
if you could demonstrate it's, that. Uh, well, the, the true high shot is that. Uh, the, the That's the high the shot, which we like very much. Then there's a really good one, which is the I've lost my car in the multi-storey. Oh, that's quite... That's also known as the lawn sprinkler. Like that. <laughs> waiting, for the, like that yes. <laughs> waiting for the things <clears throat> to come up. All this stuff is being spoiled by these... Things. This is keyless entry, okay? Now they tell us that when you walk up to the car, if you've got one of these in your pocket, the door is open, okay? So I was walking up to the car, opening the door, thinking, that's fine, you get out, lock it, and you assume if you walk away, it'll lock itself. It does, doesn't it? Well, this is it. You've got a 100 gram Merc, and you think, is that locked? So you go back, and it's open, and you think, well, it would be. <laughs> Bound to be. So yeah. you have to say to passers by, so could you just hold that? <laughs> then you go back, and then you find out it doesn't lock itself. Yeah. You have to push a button. How uncool is that? That's very cool. <laughs> I must say that I think they're going the wrong way with these sort of pairing them back, actually. With these key cards, pairing them down to nothing. I think if they really want to know their market and appeal to, let's be honest, us chaps, they should go the other way mm. and make them more elaborate. Getting back to the original question about range, I was told something, and you don't know this, I was told something this morning which sounded astonishing. So I had to try it out. I am now about 40 yards from the back of my car and the central locking is still working fine. But if I go back another 10 or 15 yards to say here, we're out of range. However, if I put the key against my head, like so, and try again. <laughs> it's working! Doesn't work like that. Does work. What have I done to my head? <laughs> it does work. It if doubles the range, pretty much. It doubles the range that it works using your head. Do you have to have your mouth open? No, no, it's just like a big amplifier. It's I just scary. don't get that. If you've got the faintest idea how that works, please write to us at uh, www.bbc.co.uk forward slash Top Gear or about anything else. Yeah, no, if you've letters. got any letters, we're not going to be doing this every week. Read them out if they're interesting. Yes, that'll um, We've got another letter oh, as yes, well. Oh, yes, I've got one here on... Um, hang on a second. This one's come from afar. It's actually come in from Saudi, which is quite a long way away. Hold on a second. <clears throat> Dear Jeremy... I, uh, my aim is to meet you in no, your... No, read out what it actually says. Dear... Dear superstar Mr Jeremy Clarkson. <laughs> and just do the end as well. Best luck to you, King. That'd be me. What on earth is the man going on about? It is rather difficult to understand. My aim is to meet you and I send with this post to VCD. It is show how I and my friends are driving. It's mm. contained. It does get a little bit difficult to follow, but the video that they sent in is very easy to follow. This is a Toyota Carina, front-wheel drive. It is. So he must be using the handbrake to make it do this into the oil tanker. No, he just misses that. Well done. Oh, th that's just madness. He, he's in the street. There are people there. This man is insane. This is the problem. You see, this is what happens when you don't let people drink. What? When you need... Oh, what's happened there? Oh, that's going to go wrong. He's gone into the wall, no, yes. Wrong. You see a new car, so you go out and you convert your kebab into a pavement pizza. That's big trouble. Oh, oh then dear. you have a fight, then you go home. Saudi Arabia looks to me like a lot more fun. Yes. But that said, you've had a laugh. I have. Porsche GT3 on our track. This shape is primeval, part of the landscape. And just as a caveman got the jitters when he saw the outline of a saber-toothed tiger, I'm pre-programmed to start shaking when I see this. So which member of the 911 species is prowling around our track? This is the GT3, a Porsche that offers you less, so it can give you so much more. It's been stripped of all creature comforts, so there's no sat-nav, there's no air conditioning, less soundproofing, even the carpets are thinner. No fancy leather seats in the front, and no seats at all in the back. And it's all in the name of saving weight. It makes no apologies for what it is. So if you want a comfy ride, get another car. If you want to be cool on a hot day, 
get another car. If you want height adjustment on the seats, which I don't, get another car. But what they've left behind is good stuff. For instance, look at the brakes. The calipers are yellow, not the usual Porsche red, and they signify something important. The discs are ceramic. Sounds like pottery, but it means they can cope with enormous punishment without overheating and fading. And then there's the engine. Oh yes, the engine. It's hand-built from exotic materials like titanium, and it's probably the most important part of the car, which is good because it costs 40 grand. Shame then, that you can't really see it. It's in here somewhere, behind this old washing machine. And it staggers me when I think where it is, still hanging out over the edge at the back. Now technically that's just wrong. It's like building a pyramid with the pointy bit at the bottom. It was a daft idea when they first did it 40 years ago, and on paper it still is today. That should be rubbish. It should be up to the usual old 911 tricks. All that weight at the back, swinging round like a big pendulum, ready to punish you the first time you run out of straight road. And talent. So you'd think that over the years they'd try and inch the engine forwards. Now, sir, look at our lovely new headlamps. Meanwhile, the engine's coming towards the front, but no. German engineers don't do U-turns. So it's still out there at the back. Wherever it is, though, what an engine. And the figures speak for themselves, 0 to 60, 4 and a half seconds. Top speed, 190. And for once, it's not scary using all that power. In the bad old days, to try and counter the handling problems, Porsche tried crude Heath Robinson measures. They stuffed the front bumper with lead to try and balance it. But none of it worked. In the 70s and 80s, the 911 was the Grim Reaper's company car. Huge crowds would gather at roundabouts to watch fat stockbrokers climb trees in their Porsches. Nowadays, though, they're a little more scientific. They've mastered the suspension and honed and polished their car until they're left with this magnificent creation. <laughs> This is an amazing machine. You can put it where you want it and then hold it in huge slides. Don't worry, I'm not the drift god. Look, I'm going sideways. Look at that! So what? Sure, it's a flaw, but it's a flaw like Cindy Crawford's mole, J-Lo's enormous buttocks. It's become its defining feature. It's the whole point of the car. The GT3 is final and absolute proof that evolution works. And after 40 years, this isn't just good, this is the best 911 ever. Do you know, that's it, that has made up my mind, I'm convinced I'm gonna go straight home tonight, rip the back seats and all the carpets out of my old 911 and turn it into a mini one of these. It's fantastic. Mm, that won't work, you'll just end up with an upturned bathtub with no seats in it. You are however, a job. however, yes. I've driven this this year and you know I'm a bit of a Ferrari man. Footballer. Yeah. <laughs> This was the best car I've driven all year, GT3. I never thought I'd say that of a 911. I can't believe I you are, but... I adored it. I'm glad to hear you say it. It is absolutely fantastic, mm -hmm. but of course there is just one test left for it, the Stig. Now before we sent him off to HMS Invincible, which we'll see in a short while, as a bit of practice, because it is bucketing out there, we sent him out on the track in this. So, schnell schnell, Herr Stigmacher. <laughs> And he's off. Now the track surface was soaking. Look at that spray. So this is going to be very lively out there. Be careful, Stig. Steady. And we made our love on oh, way. 
Instinct Lady sucking up to Martin Kemp, I think that's shameless. Now we go round Chicago, look, he really, is, he really is having to work to keep the GT3 in check here. Gonna be going into the hammerhead, now this could be the biggest test so far. You can actually see the front end lifting under the power, this is not a day for a rear engine car at all. Definitely not a day for a rear engine car out there, that is so difficult in the wet. Blasting out of the follow through and he's gonna lose it! Hang on there, Stiggy! Look at that! Not even breaking into a sweat. The last two bends now, is he gonna keep it off the grass? Tidy, tidy through Gambon at the end, and across the line, in! Now this is important. Wet track, the fastest wet lap we've ever had so far is a 911 Turbo, which of course has four-wheel drive. This doesn't, and it did his end. I cannot believe this. In the wet, one minute, 27.2. That's just, it's, look at that! That's faster than an Evo 8 in the dry! That's a, that, that, if that had been dry, I'd, I don't even think what it would have done it in. No. That's, that's gotta be. Anyway, after that momentous drive, yeah. he went off and he joined the Navy. HMS Invincible. 20,000 tonnes of aircraft carrier and home to a fleet of Harrier jump jets. This plane goes from 0 to 60 in 2.8 seconds and is hitting 100 miles an hour by the time it reaches the end of the 200-metre runway. And that has given the Stig his biggest challenge yet. 100 miles an hour in 200 metres. Obviously, he needed a special kind of vehicle. And this is it. The old Top Gear Jag. Bought for a couple of hundred quid, it was stripped of its fat and fitted with nitrous injection. That meant 500 brake horsepower. In a drag race in the last series, it beat just about every supercar on the planet. But is it enough here? Top Gun versus Top Gear. 100 miles an hour in 200 metres, and unlike the pilot, the Stig must leave himself enough space to pull up again. ready and he's off there we go now he's got to get to a hundred and then stop again here we go that's too fast uh, that was not supposed to happen and that is unquestionably the end of our Jaguar But what about the Stig? That is all that was there. The Navy divers went down, but they couldn't find anything. So uh, tune in next week and we'll, uh, we'll bring you up to speed with whatever developments have happened. See you then. Good night.